This presentation on managing ADHD is going to be split into two parts. First of all, my disclosures. I speak regularly on, uh, the, th on the topic of adult ADHD, um, and I'm involved in training in the UK and writing uh, books, and I also have a private practice. Now, this slide, in fact, was taken from a presentation yesterday uh, where this word cloud was created. You'll remember it. The reason that I want to bring it up is because right there in the middle, almost the largest symptom that you guys report is brain fog. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So let's think about the issue at hand. Well, there have been a number of studies now that have demonstrated an association between ADHD and hypermobility. So if you look at a group of adults with ADHD, uh, this looked at a group of adults with neurodevelopmental disorders, but um, a large proportion of them had ADHD. 50% of them have joint hypermobility. That's four and a half times the odds. And then if you swing it around the other way, and think about those people who have EDS, you're five or five to six uh, times more likely to have ADHD. My question to you is why? And why am I talking to you? First of all, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I'm based in London. I work in the NHS. Uh, I, um, I work in an adult ADHD service and I run a group program. Um, I'm a national specialist in adult ADHD and the training program director for this organization, UCAN, a really amazing organization that focuses on training and educating about ADHD. And the interesting thing is my colleagues who will hopefully one day look at this presentation on YouTube, these are relatively new ideas in the field of ADHD. And in many ways, uh, this presentation is launching some of those ideas because I think that these discussions need to take place. Uh, the reason uh, that um, I'm here really is because a number of years ago, I started to notice this overlap between ADHD. So my patients, I have lots of patients with ADHD and I was noticing that they very, very commonly had hypermobility and that just started me um, on a journey really. And um, it sort of brings us to today. And I was asked to talk to you about managing ADHD. And uh, uh, rather than talk about the sort of very standard presentation on managing ADHD, I'm gonna try and introduce you and possibly other people who watch this down the line, a slightly radical new way of looking at this question. Um, if you are hypermobile, then, I, then, then the, quest, the message to you is, is to really think about whether ADHD is an issue and to think about these other um, issues around the cluster that might be causing some of those symptoms. If you have ADHD and you don't have hypermobility and you're watching this, then maybe you should have a think and check whether you do have any of the features that you can relate to in this presentation. If you work with EDS or HSD, and really to think about screening for ADHD because it's so common and it's treatable. And if you work with ADHD, then I think to start looking for hypermobility and these related conditions that cluster around it. So what we're gonna do today, well, I'm gonna slight, take a slightly detour to the, uh, the, the, the focus initially. I'm gonna focus on the cause of ADHD and consider what that tells us or impacts on how we manage it particularly in hypermobility, but possibly in other people as well. And then I'm gonna spend the last few, few uh, 10 minutes or so talking about you know, the optimal management of ADHD more tradi traditionally. So first of all, what is ADHD? Well, I think this uh, word cloud shows you that it's a lot of things and it's, uh, it's a very complicated and rather confusing condition, but Essentially, um, it, it's, it's a cluster of symptoms and it doesn't tell us anything about the cause. Um, what we do know about it is that it's what we call a neurodevelopmental condition, so that it takes root in development and it affects the brain. And it's really common, look at those statistics. Those are based on, on data. So it's this characteristic cluster of symptoms Symptoms related to inattention, hyperactivity, or restlessness often, impulsivity and mood instability. 
And uh, of course, everyone can experience some of these symptoms, but in ADHD, they cluster together and they are very prominent and importantly, very impairing. We know from studying ADHD in, in depth that there's altered brain structure, function and development. It's really symptomatic and impairing. A lot of the studies that are coming out now and population studies are showing quite how uh, devastating untreated ADHD can be to people's lives. And part of that is that it's often associated with coexistent physical and mental health conditions. And often there's overlaps and confusion and misdiagnoses which doesn't really help. But when it's researched, it's shown to be a really valid diagnostic construct and it's supported by good quality evidence. And importantly, it's treatable and there are guidelines which are evidence-based. So let's think about these two areas, this question specifically of cause. What do we know that causes ADHD? Well, luckily, literally this year, there was a very important paper published in ADHD called the consensus statement. You can look it up and get it online for free. And it basically collates all the robust scientific findings associated with ADHD. And on the section about cause, it states genetic and environmental risk factors accumulate. And you've probably heard this a lot. Your genes make you vulnerable and the, the environment triggers it or they merge or interact together. But it's quite a vague term. And actually the genetic studies so far that have been looking for these real big players in terms of dopamine and noradrenaline, the, the sort of genome-wide studies have not shown up. They've shown multiple small gene effects so far. And so we have to think about, you know, what's going on. And this paragraph in that document, I think, is very important. We're only just beginning to understand how genes and environment combine to cause this disorder and cause symptoms. And it says some of these causes may be shared with ADHD somatic comorbidities. Let me explain that. That's talking about physical health problems that cluster together with ADHD. And it mentions these three, oxidative stress, inflammation, and insulin resistance. And future work, it says, should be focused on these causal mechanisms. So let's look at those associations. We know that uh, the association is strong with asthma and allergic rhinitis. I, I want to ask you if you can see a theme running through. Um, there's sleep disordered breathing, abnormalities of the eye and migraine and diabetes as well is much more highly represented in ADHD. And then if you, you think about those conditions, what about if we look at immune autoimmune disorders? Because we, we see from large studies that ADHD shares genetics with autoimmune disorders, 24% more likely to develop ADHD children with autoimmune diseases. And these conditions, you will recognize them as well because many of you will experience these autoimmune conditions and they are clustered together with ADHD. So what I wanna try and draw our attention to is that we see all these other physical health problems occurring together with ADHD. And you can either say this thing ADHD is causing those symptoms or those physical health problems perhaps give us a clue as to what might be driving the ADHD. And when we look dig a bit deeper into this area of hypermobility, we see a very important super syndrome emerging. And uh, we're going to explore that in just some detail in a moment. Let's see what's said about linking ADHD and hypermobility. This study in 2018 looked at that and they proposed three main links. One is pain, the other is dysautonomia, and the third is proprioceptive difficulties. Proprioception is your body in space. Now, I'm going to elaborate on that and just build on it a little bit. And I'm thinking about possible drivers of ADHD. Right at the top of that is dysautonomia. We're going to look at that in a bit more detail. I've created this new cluster, this new group or cluster and termed energy drains. And in it goes the proprioceptive stuff, the pain, and also this eye issue, which many people might not know about called cons convergence insufficiency. It's it, a tendency of the eyes to splay out. So all of these things absorb energy, attention, and possibly take it away from more regular attention. 
Now, I think from my journey so far that this problem, which I, I totally understand is relatively new, the data is new, but the picture that's emerging is that mast cell activation syndrome is really important in, the, in this group. And uh, I think it's often not recognized. Uh, clinicians don't know much about it, but uh, having sort of looked at this area in some detail, I believe it's causing quite significant inflammation, not just in the body, but in the brain and that neuroinflammation. And I also think an area that needs lots of attention is this craniocervical junction. And I think many of you will agree it's fundamentally important uh, as a driver of this whole super syndrome that we're talking about. And I think, again, when things start to spiral and deteriorate, autoimmunity and gastrointestinal dysfunction kick in, and they too drive inflammation in the brain. And we just have to get our heads around that perhaps ADHD uh, is an inflammatory condition, and there's lots of suggested data to support that. So we are going to focus on these two areas very briefly. So possible drivers, these two, dysautonomia, Let's have a little look at dysautonomia. So the autonomic nervous system, which my colleague Stephen just before gave a, a beautiful description of. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but it is this uh, regulation uh, of our bodily systems, basically. Um, and uh, uh, the system that keeps everything in balance. And, and it has two components that oppose each other and stay in balance, uh, hopefully. Uh, but not the case uh, in some situations. And when it's an imbalanced and disordered, it's termed dysautonomia. Um, the sympathetic nervous system, as you know, is the stress response and the parasympathetic, the relaxation response. And if that balance is lost, then a number of characteristic features occur. And probably the two biggies are orthostatic intolerance, the phenomenon of experiencing symptoms um, on standing, uh, linked to blood supply to the brain. If you don't supply a brain with blood and oxygen, it's going to fail. And I think we have to think about dysautonomia when we think about ADHD. It's, it would be um, strange not to, uh, having seen what I've seen in this particular patient group. POTS is a very troubling and disabling condition. And again, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that dysautonomia like ADHD can start in childhood and it can cause all of the symptoms we understand to be ADHD. And you can see in someone who's struggling with orthostatic intolerance, they stand up and their brain is relatively not perfused. There's a response to that which involves generating the stress response in order to compensate. And that's not very pleasant. And it it, it basically shuts down part of the frontal lobe, the stress response, and you can't really think straight. Mast cell activation, again, there's so much to talk about mast cell activation, and I, um, I'm going to keep it really brief, but these mast cells are fundamentally important cells produced by the blood, but they live in tissues, and they live in tissues that are around the body, particularly those that are exposed to the outside world. The ears, eyes, nose, throat, and the gastrointestinal and genitourinary tracts. And they are responsible for the, the, the first response to an outside attack. And that attack can be anything. And we'll look at some of those triggers. But they activate their release chemicals. One of the main chemicals they release is histamine, but there's many, many more. And those chemicals are there to try and restore some sense of balance into the system. But sometimes that goes wrong. And when it goes wrong, it can be very serious, a condition called mastocytosis. Uh, but that's very rare. Mast cell activation syndrome is a recently defined uh, immune system based disorder characterized by distinct phases of symptoms, uh, which are often triggered that either affects the whole system, the fatigue, or affect a variety of different systems of the body. They usually result from inflammation or allergy resulting from these mediators. And importantly, the brain is also affected. There's inflammation traveling around the system and the neuropsychiatric, the symptoms of MCAS that uh, are called neuropsychiatric, neurological psychiatric, you're gonna recognize them if you, if you know about ADHD, particularly the ones in green. These are uh, very aligned to what, what people with ADHD experience. And I think perhaps this is more common than we think it is. So what triggers these flares? This is really important. And the reason I'm sharing this is because you need to be, if you suspect you have MCAS or you're thinking about it, you need to be on the lookout for these triggers. And often it's infections 
Um, things like the story, the characteristic story of someone with glandular fever um, uh, or Lyme disease, and more recently COVID, that group that go on to develop long-term problems like fatigue, like long COVID. It's very likely, in my opinion, that this is linked to uh, that group having uh, this MCAS problem. Uh, there's physical trauma to the body. Exercise is a big one. Psychological trauma. Mast cells have these surface receptors for, for stress hormones, allergens and what we call pseudoallergens and toxins and foods. Basically, someone with MCAS becomes super sensitized to everything, and these things can really trigger them. So if you notice patterns and start looking into MCAS, menstrual cycle, changes in the environment. So for further details on mast cell activation syndrome, you uh, would benefit from going to this particular paper, which is from August 2019, and it looks specifically at diagnosis and management of MCAS. Uh, there's another useful review article that I've included the, the uh, reference for uh, below, which is uh, authored by Lawrence Afrin, who's been um, uh, very much driving uh, this issue forward over a number of years. There's lots of other potential references, but I don't want to overload you. So I think these are uh, a couple of good ones as a starting point. Now, what I've talked about so far is that um, there are obviously uh, there's a lot more going on uh, in people with ADHD and EDS and possibly uh, in uh, a more general sense uh, as a result of these other two conditions that may or may not be present. Uh, I think the message really is when you're thinking about ADHD management, um, particularly in this group, it's really important to, to look for, to identify, and to address dysautonomia. And secondly, uh, to look for, and if present, address mast cell activation syndrome. In addition to those two uh, areas, it's worth thinking about, is there pain present in this situation? And is that something that is reversible? And finally, uh, uh, less central, but more of a, a hope that this area gets more attention moving uh, forward, uh, to think about the possibility of dysfunction at this all-important craniocervical uh, joint. Um, uh, I recognise that at the moment, investigating that area for cranial cervical instability uh, is, uh, is a bit of a minefield because it needs uh, certain scans that involve motion, extension, flexion and rotation in order to see um, what exactly is happening during movement. And that's not straightforward to organize. I'm just gonna say just a few words briefly to finish up this part of the presentation um, about uh, an approach to thinking about addressing dysautonomia and one slide also on mast cell activation syndrome. Um, I, I want to preface this by saying that these are serious medical conditions and I, I know it can be difficult to find clinicians or practitioners who understand these areas, um, but that's a challenge you need to um, try your best to achieve um, because Ideally, uh, these, uh, these things need to be guided uh, by a clinician, uh, but there are certain things that I hope you're gonna see on this slide. There are certain things that you can do um, uh, in terms of uh, conserve, what we call conservative management, if you have features of orthostatic intolerance, for example. The central message is hydration, drink more fluids, particularly if it's hot weather, uh, and try to avoid dehydration. The problem with drinking lots of fluids is that the fluid just comes straight through you in many situations. So um, it needs to be combined with increased salt intake. Um, and one way of doing that is sprinkling a little bit of salt. I've shown some Himalayan rock salt because I think that's the, the nicest and the most natural form of salt. Uh, sprinkling a little bit in your bottle of water. Um, there are obviously, um, um, you know, me, solu um, products that you can buy um, to add to water, uh, but that's just a, a reasonably good solution. 
The third area is around compression, uh, garments, compression flight socks, things you buy to go and travel on a plane if you are vulnerable to getting deep vein thrombosis. Uh, you can get all sorts of compression um, garments, socks, uh, lycra, uh, um, leggings, or, or other garments that cover various different parts of the body. And the whole idea is that you're compressing up the column of blood and um, improving perfusion to the brain. And you can experiment with all sorts of different uh, uh, types of compression garment. And, and I encourage you to do that. It can be really, really effective. And I notice that a lot of my patients report that their sense of anxiety goes down. And because the compression material is, is tight on the skin, it's improving and increasing that proprioceptive contact. Um, certainly improves uh, proprioceptive awareness. That in itself can reduce that energy drain that we talked about earlier, and it can make you feel more contained uh, and uh, less under threat. Really. Uh, the other thing to mention is when it's hot, just be particularly careful standing uh, from sitting or lying quickly um, and calf pumping when, when you're feeling symptomatic is really helpful. And you'll actually find that a lot of people do this without realizing it. You, you, you talk to someone and they'll often be bouncing from one leg to the other um, or pacing around unnecessarily. And it's because they've instinctively learned that by moving their body and pumping their carbs, particularly it's like a, a pump of blood up towards the brain. Uh, and you might see, see some people bouncing on the spot and doing this but it's very useful so there's a few tips in there when it comes to mast cell activation syndrome again it's important to get the right sort of guidance on this um, at what point an immunologist needs to be involved is an important question but certainly the first four or five steps of this um, well most of these interventions actually um, a, a clinician who's uh, who, who has a basic understanding can guide you through this uh, it's about identifying and for certainly for a period avoiding particular triggers that, that, that are specific to you and that means working out what they are um, making changes to the diet and, and many people with mast cell will be super sensitive to histamine so bringing in low histamine foods or foods that don't release histamine um, you can try using the enzyme diamine oxidase that comes in tiny little tablets that you take 20 minutes before a meal. It's usually reserved for people who, um, who uh, don't normally eat histaminergic foods, but choose to uh, occasionally break the rules. And, and they know that by boosting the enzyme, it breaks it down better. Some people use it more routinely and regularly. Um, really the introduction of an antihistamine, uh, and there's different types of antihistamines. This is uh, an H1 antihistamine is, is, is the first uh, step in that ladder. And, Two of these on the list you can get over the counter, loratadine and cetirizine, and they generally come in 10 milligram tablets. And the important message here is that the antihistamine is often needed, usually needed twice daily, once in the morning and once in the evening, some people even three times daily. Um, fexofenadine is only by prescription, uh, and that is used uh, again twice daily. Uh, and uh, the normal dose for that is 120 milligrams. Um, Either people are going to notice a very uh, dramatic and obvious improvement with uh, this antihistamine or not. In many ways, it helps guide um, whether or not the mast cell activation is there. If you don't have evidence of it from laboratory evidence, which is a whole different discussion altogether and fraught with, with complications. And often you're going to be working with MCAS uh, as a provisional diagnosis. And the message really is to not miss anything. Um, important in terms of other potential causes of symptoms. So don't put it all down to something that you're, you're assuming it might be uh, and miss out something important. Um, and also not to do any harm. So th the steps we're including here um, are uh, in the in hands of a clinician are, um, are, 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 in my opinion, safe uh, if managed um, and overseen properly. Um, the H2 antihistamine, uh, um, basically histamine uh, works on various different points in the body, different receptors, 
and this is covering another group of receptors prominent in the gut and also uh, important in the central nervous system. The only H2 antihistamine that's, uh, that's viable really is famotidine. Um, it's sometimes used for acid reflux and the dosing usually when in mast cell activation is start at 40 milligrams at once and probably twice daily. And then um, with, with antihistamines, you're essentially blocking the inf inflammatory um, mediator histamine, which is released already. And the idea is that you're trying to limit the amount of histamine around, which is hopefully going to stop that cycle of reactivating mast cells that histamine does. So more histamine around, the more the mast cells become activated and degranulated. So um, uh, often you see quite dramatic results with antihistamines, but it's so important to just take one step at a time. So that, um, that trial of H1, I would do two weeks on loratadine twice a day, two weeks on cetirizine twice a day, and two weeks on fexofenadine twice a day, and really just... Uh, compare and contrast whether they, they work, they help, and which one's better in terms of efficacy and tolerability as well. The same you do with the H2, and if something's not working, you don't continue it. Um, you would try this, a, a two or three week trial of famotidine. And then depending on where you got to then, you may need to fine tune it and, and, and add in mast cell stabilizers again from, um, from foods and supplements moving gradually up uh, towards medications and, um, and and some medications are more complicated to prescribe than others. Um, examples of mast cell stabilizers is chamomile, uh, vitamin C, quercetin. Uh, interestingly, benzodiazepines are also powerful mast cell stabilizers, as is uh, THC cannabis, so THC particularly, but I think CBD, there's evidence as well. And then there's ketotophen is a good mast cell stabilizer, and it's also an antihistamine. And there's a number of other medications, and that's really moving beyond the remit of a non-specialist, non-immunologist. Um, throughout all of it, you need to be thinking about uh, the gut. Uh, gut dysfunction may be at the root of much of this, and it's certainly what goes wrong as things spiral. Um, and so the microbiome particularly uh, is an area that needs some attention. Uh, and the way to do that is to uh, do a stool sample with someone who knows about the microbiome um, and uh, look at what's, what's missing, what's in excess. Uh, and then you can strategize a plan to bring the gut back into sense of balance uh, in parallel to modifying the diet. Uh, again, everyone's different with what areas uh, might be triggering for them and, and what sort of diet's appropriate. So I think just to say, to get the right sort of input is quite important, at least to set you on the right path. And invariably there are flares despite, um, so I think the general feeling is that from, uh, from a assumption of mast cell activation um, to a more stable picture can sometimes take a year or two, but quite often people can be stabilized quite significantly. There's a real question here as to how much improvement in the neuropsychiatric symptoms do you get by these interventions? And my experience says some, but often not enough to avoid uh, treating ADHD as you might do normally. But certainly a big chunk of it improves. Um, and, uh, and, and these areas are really important. But invariably there will be flares and, and, and cautious use in non-sensitive individuals of these uh, of aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, really cautious because for some people they can actually trigger the mast cells, uh, but for many they can be amazingly useful treatments, sometimes short-term, sometimes in some longer term. It's really about feeling your way through making one intervention at a time, careful evaluation at each point, um, and going on this collaborative journey with your patient, which, which and the message really is, uh, this is quite a new area. It's good that we've, we've hopefully uncovered something important. Uh, let's just take it cautiously and slowly, monitoring at each stage until we find that right balance of interventions where your whole system, your uh, inflammatory responses uh, in this area are, calmed and balanced and the idea is that you then reintroduce back in uh, the foods that you've 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 omitted because you don't want to create nutritional imbalances okay so thank you very much that brings us to the end of part one of this talk of managing adhd 
Uh, in the second part, I will be focusing on a much more traditional perspective on managing ADHD um, and give you some of uh, my top tips uh, that hopefully might be helpful um, and build on what we've talked about already.